Get ready to celebrate God's call to go. Here's your weekly dose of heartwarming encouragement for the missionary in all of us. Welcome to Missions Change My Life. Now here's your host, Pastor Kevin. Good morning. I'm Pastor Kevin, founder and executive director of Global Hope India, and your host for Missions Change My Life podcast. This is a poor kid from rural North Carolina that has now flown over a million miles to 27 different countries. I've taken nearly a thousand people on mission trips to India. We've collected millions for God's work among Indian nationals. I will be sharing compelling stories of radical transformation from ordinary people. Before welcoming Lisa to the show today, let me share some additional context with you why I'm incredibly blessed to know Lisa and to have her on the show. Lisa is the Donation and Communications Manager at Global Hope India. She graduated from Union University with a degree in theology and missions. She's involved in North Wake Baptist Church in Wake Forest, North Carolina. She enjoys baking and traveling. She is what you might call a missions junkie. She says her job at Global Hope India is super fun, and she highly recommends everyone travel at some point. Ah, it's so exciting to have one of our own in the studio today, Ooh. Lisa. How are you? Good. Love that you're on staff. Love that you have a heart for missions. Even before you came on staff with Global Hope India, I'm excited to hear and just share with our listeners about your trip to Nepal before coming and joining mm -hmm. a missions organization, Global Hope India, and now your trip to India through Global Hope India. So, Lisa, 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 Whoa! how has <laughs> missions changed your life? Oh, gosh, missions is kind of my life now at this point. So I remember I was in high school and I thought I was going to be a genetic counselor. This will be great. I'll study science and then help people at the same time. I was like super pumped. But... I don't know. I just felt God kind of like calling on my heart to join my church's internship. And the only one they had left was the missions department. I was like, cool, I'm going to do this. Because yeah. it's the missions a department is like the last kid to get picked on the yeah. dodgeball yeah. team over yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I was That's so true. glad no one wanted to because it like totally transformed my life. I got to help send teams all across the country and the world. Mm. And part of my internship, I actually got to go to Nepal and South Korea. It was my sophomore year of college yeah it was just really exciting experience i was young i wasn't like worried about anything i was like let's get on a plane and go uh -huh. and at that point i think nepal's government was overthrown and we were still going anyway mm. and for some reason to me that wasn't a major concern i was like cool we'll yeah. just we'll just head on over here <laughs> went to south korea for a week and then to nepal and got to work with the south korean church in Nepal and do ministry there. If you guys don't know, Christianity is totally illegal in Nepal, like mm. extremely illegal. We just prayer walked basically the country. It was pretty life changing. I like to say I didn't know what darkness was till I went there. There's just so much poverty and grief and there's no hope and there's people praying to like people who don't respond. Like we pray to a God who responds back to us, but you could feel it. It, mm -hmm. it was almost as if you got the plan and you just felt heavier spiritually. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how to describe that really, unless it's like a ghost sat on me, but like a really fat one. So <laughs> <laughs> That's and, a pretty good analogy. Yeah, yeah. It, it will it will confuse a lot of our audience. Yes. <laughs> but it's still a good analogy. <laughs> yeah. And so from that point on, it just became apparent to me, I think I had known God existed and I loved God, but it had made my relationship more real and more spiritual rather than I think intellectual as a lot of people I think feel here in the United States. And then I came back and I was like, yep, no, I'm changing where I'm going to school. I'm changing what <laughs> I'm going to do. I'm going to be a missionary and this is going to be my life. And so ended up Joining GHI now after I'm graduating with a theology and missions degree and went to India and have been blessed by God just transforming that. Um, 
So we would lovingly say you were bit with the bug. Yes, you, you, most definitely. <laughs> yeah. And and not only just one toe in, but you dove in. <laughs> most people would say they would just probably go on a mission trip every year or maybe every other year to just kind of quell that passion. But God was telling me this is this is your life now. And yeah. just deep dive into the pool and I'm not coming up for air. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And one cool thing about global hope India is that we learned along the way, we don't need to hire staff. We need to hire missionaries. Mm -hmm. And it was such a breath of fresh air when you came through our door and from the day one, all the way through your two years now with us, you've been a missionary mm -hmm. and you, you have to do a lot of logistical stuff with accounting and yeah. <laughs> you're, you are our donations and, and communications manager. Mm -hmm. And so you answer a lot of emails for us and write scripts for social media and different things. But mm -hmm. you do all of that as a missionary. Yeah, I think a lot of our culture, at least here in the United States, thinks to be a missionary, you have to go live overseas. Yeah. And like, that is the prerequisite. But like, Paul sold tents for a living. Mm -hmm. As long as like, God's the center of what you're doing, you are living out a missionary life. Yeah. So even if even if I am doing accounting and I'm checking the numbers, I know that it goes to help a ministry and that's needed. And that is part of a missionary lifestyle. So a funny fact, Paul did sell tents, but Lisa has sold her, <laughs> her share of cupcakes that's and right. cookies yep. as a fundraiser for her trips. And so I'm pretty sure if you give a good rating to this episode, she will send you some cookies or, or cupcakes. Just make, oh, yes. make that yep. comment mm -hmm. and she'll be all over that real quick. Yep. Yeah. The one of the easiest ways to get people involved is like, hey, you want to listen? I have this freshly baked cookie. People are like, oh, yeah, sure. What you need? Yeah. So tell them about your most recent fundraiser while we're on that. It's yeah. so funny. You 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 put out on Facebook that you will you will hand deliver 12 fresh baked cookies or cupcakes. What was it? Cookies. So and this all these cookies. people took you up on it and you baked and then none of them wanted it. They yes. just wanted to give to your trip. Oh, my goodness. Yes. So I found out in like Facebook fundraising world, like one of the, my most successful has been when I said, I will bake fresh cookies. So I did a second version of this for a friend who needed help with school. And he lives in Uganda. And I was like, awesome, we'll bake some cookies. And I had so many people give. And I went to message them and was like, hey, I'm so excited. Thanks for donating. Where do you want me to send cookies? And so many times it's like, no worries. I don't eat <laughs> cookies or I don't like chocolate or I'm not a fan of sugar. I didn't send out a single cookie for that <laughs> fundraiser, even though it was titled Baking for Missions. Yeah, it's and so this is funny. a totally different story, but her brother-in-law, Billy, ate everything. Yeah, he did. <laughs> yep, yeah. So tell us about your trip to India. I went in April to Manipur and got to do a spoken English team. To oh. me, I guess, is super exciting. Love English, love grammar, love kids. So it was this perfect merge of just kind of all these skills that I love. But you hit the ground running and like, I don't know why I didn't come to this realization before, but I was thinking spoken English, we're going to stay in here like Spanish class. This is the verb form yeah. and here are the conjugations. But no, it, it really was just kind of like a wonderful time to get to know students mm -hmm. and converse with them in English. And so we played so many fun games. Yeah. We got to really know what they wanted to do when they grow up, like what their dreams and aspirations were. And so for me, it was kind of a learning lesson that what I expect isn't necessarily what's going to happen. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute, Lisa. Wait. What? <laughs> Wait just a minute. You're breaking stereotypes here, okay? So you mean you weren't put on a box in the middle of a busy um, um, intersection and given a bullhorn and told to preach the gospel in a oh, street no, preaching no. and you didn't have to uh, dodge rocks being thrown at you and <laughs> those no. kind of things? I mean, you're talking. it sounds like you had fun on a missions trip oh, and it my was impactful yes. for the gospel. Yeah, most definitely. I think it was just, it was really good because missions, especially when you go across the world, doesn't have to be you sharing the gospel explicitly. Like, this is Jesus. Jesus came down. But it's like loving people at where they are in mm -hmm. just really normal situations and then being like, how can I pray for you? We're so excited for this. Hope Will you join us at a church service? Okay. Yeah. Now you're sounding lukewarm. And it sounds like you're just love, 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 love. <laughs> and it's never really central to the gospel. Mm -hmm. Is that true? No. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. No. So, yes, I think like when you live the missionary lifestyle, right? 
God's the center. Mm -hmm. And so out of that comes love. God is love. And out of love comes all these secondary feelings of like joy and encouragement and passion that spur us on and hope. And so I think when you do missions, I definitely think you should tell the gospel story. And we did definitely do a lot of that. But I think the point was they were more open to it when we loved them where they were, right? They, we just loved them as they were going through exams and we made teaching fun and we kind of just said, we're here for you. How can we help? Mm -hmm. And I think for them that made it so life changing and their faith definitely, you saw a change. Yeah. There's two things I want to just give a visualization to our listeners. One is creative entry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Spoken English is one of those creative entries of Global Hope India. Right. So what did you appreciate about having this creative form of being able to build relationships for the purpose of the gospel? A lot of times we talk at our church about how we have to like one of our main goals, and I think of every church, is to like spread the gospel. And when you think about finding someone who doesn't know Jesus and talking to them, it's super intimidating. You're like, how in the world am I going to accomplish this? But like creative avenues are the way you do it. Teaching someone how to casually have a conversation about English, you wouldn't think, oh, that's going to get me to the gospel somehow, but it does. Mm-hmm. And I think it it makes sharing your faith and talking about God so less intimidating. Mm-hmm. And it just focuses on the other person as well. Yeah, which leads to the second value, mm-hmm. and that is people first, salvation belongs to the Lord. Right. If this is the day of salvation, you mm-hmm. can't prevent it and you can't cause it. If, if you're raised in the church in high school, you learn the idea. It's like planting a seed, right? So I plant a seed and then I may move away, but years later, there's this giant tree. I think it's mm-hmm. in essence, it's that idea because salvation is God's, mm-hmm. like we shouldn't take credit or try to push something because it's God's control. So we plant the seed of sitting down and talking to them and like giving them the gospel and we let God take care of it. Right. Mm -hmm. I think we're so tempted to take control and be like, I got that. Yes. Yay. Bing, bing, bing. The sweet spot is really trusting God and saying, okay, I I've done what God's wanted. I've loved these people well, and I'm just going to give it to God. Mm -hmm. Right. And trust him to do what he's going to do. We all know those people that can take, pay in a check in a restaurant and turn it into an altar call. Mm -hmm. And I would never fault our brothers and sisters who have a grace on them to be able to do that. But there's 99% of the people in the body of Christ that would be extremely intimidated if the pressure of missions was an altar call under every single program. Right. You know, you have to think, wake up in the morning, you have your tea and you've got to figure out altar call and you, and you go <laughs> to that school and you got to figure out altar call right. and, you, and you start a conversation and you have to figure out altar call. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not a pressure within the no. environment of Global Hope India. No. Just explain that for our listeners, because we, we at the same time don't want to uh, face the argument of, well, you're just so lukewarm, you don't really ever see salvations. We saw a lot of salvations on that team. Oh my gosh, so many. In my perspective, you actually see the fruit even more abundant than if you were trying to force or feeling the pressure is put on you for salvation. Mm -hmm. And I think this key thing, like we're trying to force, where like I think in that trip, we just let God do what he needed to do. And Mm -hmm. we didn't move out of step with what God wanted. And if something changed, we just ran with it. It was Mm -hmm. like, God's going to do what he's going to do. So we didn't have much of an agenda. And we weren't like, these are the points we're going to hit every day, A, B, C. And by the end, we're going to be like, and now the altar call, (laughs) you know, (laughs) it was. Who wants to pray the sinner's prayer? Yes. (laughs) Who wants to pray? And it was, it was seriously just, Getting to know them during the day and just really enjoying who they are as people and like relating to the issues they have and stresses as students, which is just a worldwide, I think, relatability factor. Mm-hmm. And then being able to say, come join us for dinner and some time of worship. And they had fun worshiping. And at the end, it's like, if you need prayer over anything, like, come forward. And we've got like six people up here and they'd be happy to pray with you. And I mean, 
I've prayed with probably a lot of girls, and I would say 75% of those prayers were, I'd like to accept Jesus yeah. into my life. And it wasn't like we were like, do you want to accept Jesus? They came to it on their own, and I think it was just an overwhelmingly beautifully spiritual thing to see. Did you have that understanding of evangelism before you went on an international mission trip? No. No. I think because we learned so much about evangelism in like a step-by-step basis. I think we're a very step-by-step culture. I'm going to do A, B, C, D, and that'll get me E. And that's why I was so intimidated by sharing the gospel because I was like, oh my gosh, this is so overwhelming. I have to hit these points. And it's like, red is this. And I was like, but how do you bring that up in like a regular conversation? You know, you're probably hitting (laughs) the central intimidation Mm -hmm. that keeps people from going on an international mission trip because they already Mm -hmm. know this is not the joy ride through the country. This is going and sharing the gospel. Yep. But I'm so intimidated to share the gospel. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm not even comfortable with being able to recite A, B, C, and D. Right. And so there's just one reason after another why I am a big fan of everybody that does go, but it's just not for me. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you the joy that I experience when I see our team, like in Manipur Mm -hmm. in April, really seeing the abundant life and the freedom of the Holy Spirit to to just do what he wants to do in a person's life. We've heard it. You can't go to any leadership training event and not hear people do not care how much they, how much you know until they know how much you care. Right. But yet whenever it comes to evangelism, it's like we've been trained that that is okay to, to get to a altar call before you get to a relationship. Mm -hmm. 99.9% of the people walking on planet earth today are not waking up this morning with what must I do to be saved? Right. But they do feel lonely Mm -hmm. and they do have a boatload of needs. And if we can just show them how much we genuinely care and, and, you know, like one of our examples is our clean water projects. Right. I love our clean water projects <laughs> because you have to prove nothing, mm-hmm. zero, and you get water. Yep. You can be Hindu and you get water, Muslim and you get water, Fo- Jesus follower and you get water. It's not about that at all, but it is an opportunity for the body of Christ to be beautiful in the community, to mm-hmm. be resourceful in the community, mm-hmm. to be caring in the community and to build relationships of trust whereby people are then attracted to the Jesus that has changed our lives. The majority of what I heard from the students is like, so the way that they did school was they lived at school while school was in session, and then they would go home. So a lot of them were like really missing family. They were really stressed about work. They have a lot of issues very similar to us, lots of low-income like families. And so there's a lot of stress there, and on top of that, Teaching is very formal in India. So mm-hmm. apparently teachers, I think here in the U.S., we have casual teachers. You've got mm-hmm. that fun teacher that everybody loves, and then you've got kind of a wide variation. But for them, teaching and education is super strict. And so when we came in and they were prepared for us to teach, the first day it was a little hard to break through that. We were like, oh, well, no, we're here. We're here to have fun. I'm mm-hmm. not a professional teacher in any aspect. We're just here to enjoy and like get you guys comfortable and going. And I think as the week went on and we were just intentional with people and we just loved people well, you saw them start to open up. We would come into the classroom on like the third and fourth day and people would be cheering and smiling and they were excited to play games and they're excited to speak English. And that transferred over into the worship nights mm-hmm. as well. The first couple of nights, I don't think I was at the first one that first night, but the second and third worship nights, they were passionate about it. But as it grew with mm-hmm. our closeness with them during the day, I saw them like become more vulnerable before God at night. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I think that was definitely a thing where I was like, wow, God is just really working because it, it wasn't based on my skill and it wasn't based on any way I presented anything. It was just letting God do what he needed to do. And Mm-hmm. It's crazy awesome. I want to just describe for our listeners the the actual program and the schedule. Mm-hmm. So during the day, the team would go in to multiple classes each day, and mm-hmm. they would do spoken English drills in the school day. Mm-hmm. But then we would offer an optional 
worship experience at night. Mm -hmm. No one could be coerced or forced or manipulated to come in. Right. And if there were three people there, we were going to have this worship experience. Mm -hmm. And so I would say the first night, probably 75 to 80 percent. Right. The third night, 85 to 90 percent. Mm -hmm. And by the last night, yep. everybody and their brother was there. Yep. Yeah. And the trust just continued to increase. And this was voluntary. Mm -hmm. No one was required to be there. The nope. teachers weren't requiring it. Right. The school administration wasn't requiring it. The team was not manipulating it. No. It was just mm -hmm. the witness of a move of God. Mm -hmm. And God really took advantage of that in, in ministering to people's hearts. Mm -hmm. How was that helpful to you as a missionary to, to have a program like that? It was a really good environment because in the day... People are there to learn. That's their expectation. And so they were really open to what we had to say. They were excited to play the different games and go through the different drills. And then we'd end it be by like saying, we'll be here tonight for a really awesome worship night. Feel free to come if you want. We'd be happy to see you guys there. And I think it takes the pressure off of, if you've ever dealt with like teens in youth ministry, sometimes it feels like you're talking to a like a wall because they've been forced to be there. Their parents are like, you're going no matter what. But in this situation, they came open because mm -hmm. they came on their own, right? Mm -hmm. I think that creates an openness in both sides where they're able to see we're being vulnerable and we're able to see them being vulnerable. And it creates this like beautiful worship experience. I just love the environment of freedom. The word says it is for freedom that Christ has set it set us free. Mm -hmm. And it's just important for we as believers to realize that we serve a, a God where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Mm -hmm. And so we should be free as a team. The people and beneficiaries of our ministry should be free, but most importantly, the Holy Spirit should be free. Right. And that was really uh, modeled in that program there in the, this is a government high school. Mm -hmm. in India. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it was crazy. I mean, so many people I came back and I told them about my mission trip. I was like, we were at a government high school and we did all this. And they're like, a government high school in India let you do this. And I was like, I know <laughs> when God gives you miracles like that, yeah. you just fall into them. And now imagine yourself on the forward mission field. You and your team are on the bus going to today's programs. After singing a few songs, Pastor Kevin stands to deliver a devotion. Hey team, gather around. Before we go out into the mission today, I want to encourage you with this word. Think of the word prayer. I want you to, to visualize the word prayer. Pastor Cho in South Korea started his day every day with two hours of prayer. His leaders came to him one time and said, Pastor, there's so many problems. We need your help. We need it right now. And he said, okay, I know what I need to do. Now I need to start spending three hours in prayer each day. Ephesians 6, 18 says, pray in the spirit at all times and on all occasions. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayer for all believers everywhere. We are called to pray continuously. Prayer is a lifestyle. It's not something that we're going to sandwich between dear God, say our prayer, and then say in Jesus' name, amen. The Holy Spirit is actually interceding for us at all times. Romans 8, 26 and 27 says, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what we want to pray, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And so the Holy Spirit is always praying, but it also teaches us that Jesus is always interceding for us. Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on our behalf. And then listen to Romans 8.34. Who then can condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised 
to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. The Holy Spirit's always praying. Jesus is always praying. So the point is prayer is always happening. It is like a Wi-Fi signal that is always there that we can immediately connect to. And when we do, we don't need to run into this time of prayer with our own prayer agenda, but begin to listen in and let Jesus' prayer agenda become our prayer agenda. Actually, the Holy Spirit will put the words of Christ into our minds and even onto our tongues if we will allow him. He is not confined to our language. So go into the mission today realizing that one of our works today will be prayer. Remember the word prayer. Think of the word prayer. And at any moment, go into that prayer realm. Pray continuously in the Spirit. So today throughout our mission, I encourage you to think of the word prayer. All right, you ready? Come on, let's do it. Ready, set, go. Global Hope India empowers the church in India through multiple channels. One of the most influential methods has proven to be sending individuals on short-term trips to India. During your 10 days in India, you will make a difference, be the hands and feet of Jesus, and see the lives of Indian internationals transformed by the gospel. We have opportunities in children's ministry, women's ministry, job training, medical missions, and more. Experience a life-changing adventure. If you're looking to make an impact, India is the place and GHI is the opportunity. See our trips at globalhopeindia.org forward slash go. We want to give some local love to the IT gurus at Wingswept in Raleigh, North Carolina. Wingswept is a B2B technology services company that focuses on leveraging technology to meet your business objectives. Not only do they love to maximize your technology ROI, but their founders, Jay and April Strickland, invest a portion of their profits for gospel expansion ministry. We recognize them for their witness for Christ and their corporate practice of generosity. Check out their website today at wingsweb.com. So Lisa, let's just make this as crystal clear for our listeners as possible. We've all heard the excuses. We've heard the stereotypes. They perceive international missions to be that opportunity for professional evangelists. Mm -hmm. Everything you're describing throws that out the window. Right. Yep. <laughs> are, you, are you hearing what you're saying? Oh, yeah. So are you a professional evangelist? No, I wouldn't. No. Nope. Should we should we go to uh, Lisa Evangelistic Ministries dot com? No, and nope. and find your website. And, and we're not making fun. I mean, because no, there no, is no. a gift on many people to mm -hmm. be that a professional evangelist. But if that is all that missions is for, we're talking about hopefully one percent of the Christian body. Most definitely. And what yeah, about yeah. the other ninety nine percent? I mean, we just get to sit back and not like, have... You, you got this. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like you were saying if you are willing to learn how to love people, then you have an opportunity on a short-term mission trip. Oh, yes. I definitely agree with that 100% because God is a relational God. You don't have to have yourself all together. You don't have to be good at public speaking. Love your neighbor as yourself is... One of the things Jesus says is the most important. When you go on a mission trip, I think it can be intimidating because you're like, oh, I'm not a leader. I don't really know much about the culture, and I'm not really good at sharing the gospel with others. But that's not what God called you to do. He called you to love others. So let's share a two yeah. story, okay? We are in a remote village in Manipur mm -hmm. at a very small, humble school mm -hmm. in Tashar Village. And the team is passing out hygiene kits yeah. to all the students there. And you happen to be closest 
team member to the platform and I call you up <laughs> and you immediately say, oh, no, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Lisa, are you comfortable with public speaking? No. People are going to hear you on this podcast and say she did an incredible job. If I could speak publicly the way that she does, I would go on a mission trip too. But would you say that the vast majority of your mission trip experience has been you holding a mic speaking in public? No, no, yeah. oh, no, definitely not. <laughs> I wish people knew how much you resist. We're not just talking about you don't have a sense of calling and you're not comfortable public speaking, but you actually resist public yes. speaking. You yep. literally said, nope, <laughs> nope, nope. When I, and I, we had already, you and I already had a mutual agreement. I will not ask you to share your testimony, yeah. <laughs> but I will ask you to pray. And you mm -hmm. said, okay, I will, I will pray. Yep. And so I was wanting you to pray a blessing over the school and until, I identified, Lisa, I'm only asking you to pray, you would, you, you were saying, nope, nope, nope. One of my greatest fears is public speaking. So mm -hmm. like, this is a really easy format to talk because, you know, there's community here. There's not a lot of people in here. If there were like 50 people, well, no, 25 people in this room, game up. I'd be like, mm -hmm. like tomato red. I probably couldn't tell you what I said after we got out of this and be like, I have no idea what just happened. I mean, mm -hmm. The worst at public speaking. I mean, I gave a, one of our senior projects in college was we had to give a speech about our main research paper at the end of the year. And there were like some of my favorite teachers were in the room and they're experts in their field, right? I don't remember a single thing I said. I mean, I worked all year on this project and I don't, I just don't remember. So for me, it, I think it was really good. I'll probably be more open to public speaking because growth areas, right? We should grow in places we're afraid. But I I don't think missions is that. It's not getting up in front of the mic and being like, hello, hundreds of people. Yeah, right. You know, it was is for I think our team for the majority of the time is very intimate relationships of just like, Here's one on one, or we're talking with ten to fifteen students, and it, mm -hmm. it was more of that kind of relation rather than speaking to the masses. Okay, let's be honest. You did admit to something that many of our listeners are going to have a hard time with, and that is praying in public. Mm -hmm. um, have you always been comfortable praying in public? Oh yeah, you have. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yep. <laughs> okay, you're not right, <laughs> but praise the Lord for that. Most people aren't. Right. So. I think praying's different, right? You're talking to one person. Yes. <laughs> and you don't have to care about what everybody else does. But we are, we're so tempted to really care about what other people think as we are praying. Right. I think so. And I, I've, like, I've also preached before to our church. And for me, that wasn't as nerve wracking because I think the focus isn't on what am I going to say? What am I going to do? It's, it's like talking to God or saying what, you know, God has called you to say. So it's a very different approach, mm -hmm. right? And so praying in public, I feel like is is just a more natural way. The only difference in my life is that there's a mic now. Mm -hmm. and so there it. were seven people on our team. Mm -hmm. Did every single one of them pray out loud in public? No. Are you forced to do something that you're at that moment not comfortable doing? No, oh, not at all. I think that was really good too, because there was, there was room there where we were kind of challenged. Okay. Like if this is in your bandwidth and you're really good at it, mm -hmm. we are calling you to do this. But if you're not comfortable with this, there is no pressure. There are no hurt feelings here. Mm -hmm. And I think that that really allowed people to come to their own terms of like, okay, I think I can do this or mm -hmm. I can do that. Yeah. So. Do you remember the two things that we do pretty much ask all of our travelers to to India to at least consider sharing the testimony was one of them. Yep. And then, yeah, praying on your own, but is praying or like giving a, like a verse or a scripture that God's put on your mm -hmm. heart. It's a challenge, but I think it's a good skill to have. Right. And mm -hmm. it's, and it's consider is the term, right? Will you consider doing this? And if God calls you to do it, yeah. go, you know. So we've taken nearly a thousand people to India mm -hmm. and I've seen every almost every single one of them be willing to give an account. Now that doesn't have to be a sermon. It can be a scripture, but some some pointing of people to Jesus, whether that's sharing your testimony or just sharing a passage where you sense God has laid on your heart and spoken to you. Right. We do ask 
every traveler to be willing to pray with people one on one, mm-hmm. and they can pray so soft that no one hears them. There's mm-hmm. no condemnation. There's no judgment. No one's going to be a Simon Cow. Yeah, uh, and <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, just being vulnerable in a relationship to to really ultimately care for people, mm-hmm. uh, being willing to pray for them is one of the most caring things that we could ever offer. So one of the features of our trip to Manipur was that the um, end of every day there'd be a service and at the end we'd pray one-on-one with people or sometimes people would come in like groups of two or three Mm -hmm. and they'd want prayer together and you just kind of ask hey like I'm so happy to pray for you is there anything you need prayer over and they kind of tell you and then you just pray over them And, and again you're not being graded no one's up at the top of the stage like Here's the mic. Listen to her pray. Like it's a very intimate setting. Right. And so I think we can feel overwhelmed like, oh, I probably don't pray that well. People wouldn't feel blessed by it. But I think just listening to what they need prayer over and simply like coming up with a format in which you pray to God on their behalf. That's the part that they care about, not how pretty it sounded. Yeah. So we interrupt this episode for a commercial about the move of God. Mm -hmm. Take just a moment and unpack What did you see happen when the team surrounded the front of the auditorium and offered to pray for the students? What happened? Mm -hmm. Was it like a root canal? Did you have to force people to come up for prayer? What happened? (laughs) Oh, my goodness, no. We prayed for a long time because people, I think when you do altar calls at churches nowadays, it's like you get seven or eight people, depending on, like, the size of your church. You may get, like, 20. But, like, here, it it completely shocked me the first night I Mm -hmm. did it. Ever, I feel like everyone came up. That's probably not true. But there were so many people just ready to receive prayer, and they wanted to be prayed over. And some people even came back like a second or a third mm-hmm. time because they had something else they wanted to share. It was just so beautiful to see that, too, the openness of, you know, maybe I'm not in a place where I feel like I regularly pray, but they came and they're like, will you pray this over me? Mm-hmm. And oh my gosh everyone was crying up at the front people were holding hands and oh it's just i think such a beautiful image of like what happens when we trust god and we kind of take ourselves out of the picture Mm -hmm. and we just say okay i'm here these are high school students and we have Mm -hmm. photos in our social media they're lined up 20 deep yeah waiting to be prayed for Mm -hmm. and all across the front of the auditorium uh every night yeah. And there's just such an incredible move of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So our time's almost up, but you said something very early on that I just want to talk about for a moment. You said that in your first mission trip, you went to Nepal. Mm-hmm. Nepal is close to the gospel. You had to be very careful. And what you right. ended up doing most of your time was just prayer walking mm-hmm. the city. A lot of people, let's just be honest, would say, what a waste of time. I mean, <laughs> How much did that cost you? You're talking thousands of dollars just to go over and pray on somebody else's soil. Mm -hmm. Uh, Why don't you sit at home in your comfortable bedroom on your fluffy mattress (laughs) and pray for (laughs) Nepal? I can sit right here and pray for Nepal. Mm -hmm. Is there anything the Lord has taught you about the value of being in that, on that soil, being in front of the people that you're praying for? And what would you say to people who would say, I'm not so sure I can take a mission trip and it be the assignment of prayer. That just seems like such a waste of resources. Mm -hmm. I think it puts you in a different sphere. So I've prayer walked before and I've also prayed for the nations like in your room during Mm -hmm. like quiet time. And I think the difference is the tangible changes. So like when I'm in my room and I'm praying for like a specific partner or Maybe I'm praying for like the ministry partners I was with in Nepal. I have a memory to go back to. But before then, it was just kind of like, oh, on this map, there's the country of Nepal and they have some temples and stuff like that. And it's not personal. But when we went to Nepal and we started to prayer walk, it was very different. So usually when I prayer walk, I get really distracted here. Mm-hmm. I'll like start praying and then I'm like, oh, I'm kind of hungry. Popcorn. And then you have to kind of like center yourself back. But mm-hmm. when you walk into a country that's not your own with just the intention of praying over them, I mm-hmm. think God really works in your spirit to get you there. Mm-hmm. 
we would walk around, we'd see temples. We got to see like this girl named the living goddess Mm. and like our hearts broke and out of that brokenness, we prayed Mm -hmm. and God really showed us what broke his heart as well. And you almost come to this sensation that I can't do anything but pray, Mm -hmm. right? Like this is a super close country. Like if I do anything, I could hurt partners here who are trying to stay as secure as possible. But the one thing I can do is pray. Mm -hmm. Um, And God really rewarded that. And I don't think prayer is a small thing either, right? That's a communion with God. You're Mm -hmm. in a conversation and you have to trust that he's going to honor that and just kind of leave it there. But now when I pray, I see like the streets I walked and I Mm -hmm. see the people who needed prayer or Mm -hmm. the children who just have no homes and are living on the streets. And you're like, I know, I know how to pray and I know the need. Mm -hmm. And I definitely suggest that if anyone has like been praying over an area and you've never gone. Well, let's just talk for a moment about the power of prayer. Mm -hmm. I remember going many years ago to a Billy Graham school of evangelism. And it was one of the first times I really heard the methodical strategy of how he ends up on the platform in a city. Mm -hmm. And long before he takes the mic and begins sharing the gospel, there has been a group of pastors in a city that were praying together. Mm -hmm. And one of his values was he always looked for a movement of prayer before he agreed to the crusade. And then building up to the crusade, it was all an effort of prayer because Mm -hmm. he, he really had a firm conviction that unless God moves, it is a waste of human resources. But if Mm -hmm. God is moving, things can happen that only God can do in convicting the world of sin and bringing uh, salvation and restoration. And so when, when you really look and dissect Dr. Billy Graham's ministry, you, you see a foundation of prayer. Mm -hmm. And, and so some of our listeners, you know, may not be acquainted with that and think, okay, So you're literally going to fly thousands of miles to Nepal (laughs) and you're going to walk the city there and all you're going to do is pray. But yet there is so much value in not doing anything else but pray because it is so powerful. Mm -hmm. What has God taught you about the power of prayer? I think that trip really changed the way I view prayer before we even left. So this is a conjoined team of some of our church partners in South Korea and then us. We all went to Nepal to do this prayer walk. So we were a very like international team just off the bat. We were all sorts of ages. Some of them were head pastors in our church um, and head pastors from their church all the way to just kind of youth. The first night before we left for Nepal, we all sat down in the sanctuary. We were on this stage. No one else was in the room. And we kind of held hands and we prayed that God would be present in the room. And the first time in my life, I just felt like the Holy Spirit like took a fan and went whoosh. And like everyone started to just weep out of like this really weird, overwhelming sense that like God was there. Mm -hmm. That really spurred us on to pray with a purpose, right? Because Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times when we pray, we sometimes feel like God's not listening or we feel like no one's there. But in that moment, I was like, oh, yeah, he's listening now. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. And so when you go to pray, knowing that God's listening and God's moving, his spirit has like sent you. Mm -hmm. I think it gives you the power to keep going and really just watch. I mean, so many things in the Bible even show you that God had the power of prayer. Mm -hmm. And all you had to do was ask and God moved. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and so we definitely were believing that for Nepal. You know, we might not be able to help in certain ways. We might not be able to set up a church Mm -hmm. unless we're like in the rural sides of Nepal. But he honors the prayer and he moves through that. Mm -hmm. Prayer is not a small thing. Yeah. When people go to our website, they can see four actions. One is pray, give, Mm -hmm. go, and then resources that GHI offers. And prayer has always been a very core value. We really believe God has called us to empower the church in seven areas. And one is to empower prayer. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's been well said that when we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. And we all want to be a part of changing the world. 
but that's a very daunting task. But if we will learn the value and the power of prayer, we can see how life changing it can be, mm-hmm. how world changing it can be and never underestimate the power of prayer. And right. I'm, I really appreciate your testimony. I'd love for us to close out this episode with you just praying for people to have a spirit of prayer. Mm-hmm. There are people that are listening to this episode that really just need to pray and say, God, what are you asking me to do? Mm-hmm. Will, will you go where you, where he says, go, will you do what he says do? And, and that can be birthed in just, just a simple prayer. Right. And will you, will you put feet to your prayer? Will you put hands to your prayer? Mm-hmm. But it all begins with a prayer. Father, we are just so thankful for you, that you're a relational God, that you're a God who moves in mighty ways. We just pray over everyone in this room, everyone who's listening to this podcast, whether they're driving down the road or doing homework or maybe just listening at home. Father, um, we pray over them a spirit of just getting um, down to know you, Lord, the humility it takes to pray and trust that you'll do what you've said you've done. So, Father, we just ask that you would give us spirits that are open to talk with you, um, open to listen to what you have to say, um, open to hear what you've called us to do and to follow that out. No matter what happens in our interactions through the day, that our first instinct would start to be what can I do to pray? How can I pray? And so, Father, we just ask that you bring your spirit to um, allow us to be close with one another, and that you would reward the relationships that we've created and those times of prayer with just sweet joy. We thank you for the gift of prayer and intercession on behalf of Christ, and we are just sending you all the glory for that father i pray over these listeners that as they may be thinking about missions that you would just offer them a step to pray to get to know you more to get to know your mission more in your heart and that they would be open mm-hmm. we thank you father in your son's name and hey, thank you so much lisa mm-hmm. so every listener is going to get a batch of cookies from you right that's right Yes, yeah, I would so totally leave your comments. be excited about that. This is the week for some of the greatest comments ever. That's right. All right, thanks, Lisa. God bless. Do you have a story for us? We've set up a dedicated phone line to record your story. Simply dial 95-MISSION-5. That's 95-MISSION-5. How has your mission trip experience changed your everyday life? Call 95-MISSION-5 and leave us a message. If we use your message on the show, we'll send you a Starbucks e-gift card. That's 95-MISSION-5. This episode is complete, so head over to globalhopeindia.org for show notes, resources, and opportunities to go to India through GHI. Continue to be radically transformed by God as you live out the Great Commission, and we'll see you again next week here at Missions Change My Life.